the Iranian community when you know there was very little immigration of Iranians into the U.S. before the revolution. Uh, in the 1970s, uh, there was a big surge of uh, Iranians here, but they were uh, the majority, overwhelming majority of them were students. They had a student visa, uh, and they formed the largest uh, foreign student body in this country. So, uh, you know, b between 50 and 60,000, it's it's quite large. Right now, it's the Chinese, uh, but then it was the Iranian uh, students, and many of them were leftists and Marxists. And any time the Shah came for a visit or something, there was demonstrations against it. Uh, so, uh, we have this b b background of of um, uh, immigrate um, of um, student uh, presence here. After the revolution, the, there were several different waves of, of, uh, of departures uh, for, from Iran. Of course, the biggest and the first one was really the well-to-do, um, who, uh, on the heels of the revolution, when they saw everything was, uh, that they were going to lose everything, uh, and many of them left. Uh, and not only they were going to lose everything, but they were also going to be punished if they stayed. So many of them left the country with lots of money. They were educated, they, ri they were rich. Um, the second wave was of, uh, of, of religious people who, uh, as they saw that uh, the, the, the new government was becoming Islamic, uh, and, and fearing persecution and so forth. So a large number of minorities, the Baha'is and the Jews and the Armenians and the, the Syrians and, and, and so forth, um, uh, left, uh, left the country. Uh, um, the, the, the next wave in the, in the 1980s and 1990s uh, basically saw more professional people and, and, and people who were poor, who were because of difficult situations, because of the war, um, uh, people were uh, were escaping the country to 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 come here. So the 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 profile of Iranians really changed from upper class uh, exiles and so forth to uh, all kinds of uh, and minorities to all kinds of people. It's interesting that at the beginning, in the, in the first 10, 10 years of the, or or fifteen years, the majority of the of the of the Iranian exiles and they were all exiles at, the, at that point because they were um, all agreed upon the fact that they would go back home soon, that things will uh, turn out better and this regime will not last and will go back home. And so in some cases, some of them didn't uh, unpack their suitcases. They, they, uh, they lived uh, out of the suitcase. Um, but of course, that, uh, that, cha that, uh, that changed and they stayed and, 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 uh, and they became immigrants and then they had children and their children became ethnics. Uh, uh, they became Iranian Americans, hyphenated uh, people who then played the politics of the hyphen uh, and, and, um, in a very interesting ways. So that's uh, that's the evolution of uh, um, and then uh, so exile changed to immigration, uh, changed to uh, ethnicity, and I think uh, gradually it has now changed into diaspora. Uh, which means that Iranians have become really aware of not only their uh, binary relationship between here and there, between here and home, which was the, the chief uh, sort of a structure that the exiles and immigrants had, but it has become multi the relationship has become multilateral. And, and, and uh, so Iranians have relationship not only with home, the old country, so to speak, but also with each uh, compatriot communities uh, Across the world, so um, uh, Iranians. When you talk, when you th Iranians think of themselves, they think of not only Iran or LA, but also of Toronto, of Montreal, of Chicago, of Houston, and of Australia and Paris and London and and so forth. So a whole kind of a a, a, a lateral, horizontal identity has evolved instead of the vertical relationship between here and there. Vertical because the there Iran was the root of identity, uh, was the authentic one, and and so everything referred to that. But now I think people are out, are coming out of that uh, desire for purity and for authenticity, and and they can see that they don't have to be at home in order to be Iranian. That they could be Iranian uh, in other places, and so I think that's a kind of a freedom. And I think this period of diasporization for Iranians is going to be incredibly powerful, both politically because Iranians, of the diasporic Iranians, as 
uh, is emblematic of the IAB uh, uh, people who are participating in the IAB conference and people who organize the IAB, like yourself, is that they're not defensive about being Iranian. Um, they are born in here, or they've been raised here most of their lives, and this is their country, and uh, they have a right to demand uh, the resources, the response, and take the responsibilities that come with it as well. So um, they're not hiding in some closet, uh, some ethnic closet, uh, fearful of their accent or of telling that they're Iranian or they're Muslim even. Uh, because Muslim, uh, th 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 that's the, another dynamic that's really quite interesting. At, at first, m uh, the Muslims found themselves to be minority in this country. While the the minorities, the, the the religious minorities, who were a minority in Iran, in exile together became the majority Iranians, and that shifted the power structure completely. The Muslims who were on top now they were minorities, and they didn't know how to be minority. While the the, the Jews who were minority in Iran they knew how to be a minority here. They set up uh, self-help organizations. They connected up with other Jewish organizations and raised funds. And you know, they, they knew what the minor minority minorities did very well, and they did it here very successfully, and they <coughs> assimilated very quickly. The Muslims, on the other hand, who were all, all powerful and didn't have to justify their existence anywhere at home, now had to... Um, had to deal with that, and many of them did not know how to do that. And, and the, the trauma actually it was very traumatic for them, for the Muslims, uh, um, uh, because partly also because many of them were secular. So they didn't want to go towards creating kind of religious uh, identity for them uh, when they had already abandoned religion at home. Why, sh why should they create a Muslim identity here? So. That's why organizations such as EAP and, 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 and other um, cultural and professional organizations are the way I think Iranians will flourish. I had written three books on, on diaspora and exile cultures and cinema uh, before, and throughout that period I was also in the background working on another project that was sort of a, my baby. Um, um, which took about 40 years or so to really come to fruition finally uh, as a package, a set of four volume books on social history of Iranian cinema. And so it, it, it basically goes from 1897 um, when uh, the first film exhibitor, Iranian film exhibitor, on a trip abroad uh, sees film um, in London and writes about it in his diary, which is later published. So I take this date as the, as the beginning of uh, uh, cinema coming into Iranian consciousness. Um, and so volume one focuses on cinema during the Qajar period from that date, 1897, um, to uh, 1941, which is the, when Reza Shah abdicates. And volume two, uh, begins with uh, Muhammad Reza Shah coming to power in 1941 and uh, basically covers his entire uh, reign until the revolution, uh, which is, this is the, the, during the period that Iranian cinema really comes to, to the fore as a, as a national cinema. Book three focuses on the transition period, begins with the last year of the Pahlavi and ends in, in, in 1984, uh, the, uh, during, the, during the period of purification process, Islamization of the country, where the government begins, the Islamic government really comes to consolidate itself as, a, as the sole uh, government in, in Iran. And then volume four focuses from 1894 to 2010 on various um, modalities of filmmaking uh, in Iran. Uh, this, uh, pays uh, particular uh, attention to the role of women both behind the camera and in front of the camera, a long chapter on that, a long chapter on documentaries and the politics of documentary filmmaking, and then another chapter on, on the art cinema film, uh, filmmakers, uh, which, who become world uh, renowned in festivals as well as in commercial cinemas. And the last two chapters focus on really newer areas. One of them has, has to do with the way public diplomacy is using media um, 
since Iran has no official relationship, especially with the U.S., most of the relationship between the two countries is through either clandestine operations, espionage and so forth, or through public uh, media uh, representations. And that has made the relationship between Iran uh, and, and, and the U.S. really very interesting and, and unique. So that chapter on, on that deal. And the last chapter, of course, focuses on the important emergence of Iranian diaspora filmmakers and cultural, uh, 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 culture makers. Overarching part of the theme of the book is that Ir Iranian cinema is, has uh, benefited from um, exchange relations with the, other, with the other cinemas of the world, that it was never an isolated cinema, that in, in some ways from the beginning it was a transnational uh, cinema. The first um, footage that we know of that, and, and, and that we have available shot by an Iranian was shot in Europe in 1900. Uh, the first uh, um, uh, sound film um, was made by, by an Iranian poet in, in India, uh, Abdul Hussein and Sepanto. Um, a lot of the public diplomacy films that we were talking about uh, the internet films that I will be talking about at this uh, lecture um, uh, is made by people uh, um, who live abroad. Um, and so the whole definition of what is national cinema and so forth, I think, has undergone change. <laughs>